I couldn't stop thinking about this presentation once I realized I was going to give it, and I kept adding slides to it over the last few days. So um, we'll go through them pretty quick. There's a lot, but it's all pictures. We're, we're going on a little field trip through the Southwest. And I realized the title is The Astronomy of Chaco Style Great Pivas and Their Site Visibility. But um, really, what I'm going to be presenting is what I did uh, 18 and a half years ago. And it actually took about five or six years to complete my obsession with landscape and landscape features, which is basically what this is all about. Um, and that's the inner site visibility part of it. But as you know, um, this is Chaco Ruins National Monument. Uh, how many people have been to either Chaco Canyon or most of you? So I, I, I take it most of you know what a great house is. <clears throat> so what we're looking at is the Aztec ruins, great house, Aztec West. And as you notice, there's, if I can, you can't see it. Yeah, I don't screen. know if it like wants to show on the screen. Well, I can just point. <laughs> but does that do the people at home any good? Uh, there is a pointer on the lower left hand corner of that control panel. Oh, with that. Um, where, where the arrow's pointing now, just a little bit to the right, there's a laser pointer option. Oops. Where there's a pencil, just yeah. right. 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 And so that going to be the laser pointer? Yeah. So you can just use this pad to move it. Oh, uh, okay. Okay, um, so I'll just use it. Yeah, it. yeah. <laughs> anyways, as you notice, there's the full moon rising. Uh, yeah, and, right? yeah I'm, I'm only gonna use it when I have something to point at, so. Uh, so anyway, um, let's see, enter is gonna take me forward. Yeah. So um, this right here is a map of the Chaco and regional system, which is basically the Four Corners area. We're looking at New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, and Colorado. Uh, just for your reference, uh, Cortez is up here, Durango's over here, Chaco Canyon's down here, and Aztec is actually right up here along the San Juan River. So. In 2004, I was an archaeological technician at Aztec Ruins. And um, in the course of my work there, I basically noticed this on one of my first days that I was working there during the summer. And basically, the, the full moon was starting to rise in the general orientation of the Great House, which I'm um, going to show in a minute here. But anyways, this is kind of an overview of, of the West Ruin. And this is a map of the area. Um, basically, so we're at Aztec Ruins right here. And um, while I was there, um, the full moon was visible from the south out, off of the plaza. And um, basically, when I started photographing, and I'm going to show you those photographs in a few minutes, is the moon, when it was at its major standstill at the northern maximum. So um, does that mean anything to anybody? Um, if, if you're familiar with astronomy at all, and the whole reason we're looking at Chimney Rock, Colorado here, and just for your information, this is Kim Malville and Linda Cordell and Brenda Todd. And basically in 2004, Brenda Todd did the last excavation at the Great House. And, and Kim Melville is the guy that first noticed this. And basically what we're looking at is, is the full moon rising between the tin, twin pillars of Chimney Rock. And it only does this once well, over, over a, a two year period, once every 18.3 years. And it does this because of the cycle of the moon. And anyways, I got invited, oh, I'm going the wrong way. So how do I go back? So basically this event, which happened in 2004 was, was the full moon event. And the reason 
that I wanted to give this talk now is that you can go to Chimney Rock uh, during the summer, anytime during the full moon, and they'll have uh, an event where you can actually go to the top of the Pueblo here and, and see the moon rising like I did 18 and a half years ago. So uh, there's a Pueblo that's on the, so Chimney Rock is on top of a mesa that's roughly, I think it's about 600 feet above the, the plain of the river. And uh, it has a Pueblo, which we're looking at here. And the Pueblo itself is placed in a viewpoint where you can see the twin pillars. So once again, the reason I was there was because of this moonrise event. And once again, this is happening at Chimney Rock. It'll probably happen four different times over the summer. And you can go online and make reservations to, to be there at sunrise or, or sunset and, and watch the moon rise between the pillars. So the reason this is such a special event is what we're looking at now. And this is, this is a sol solstitial map, which basically is showing the solstices and, um, and the moon rises, basically. And if you notice where the pointer is now, it says Northern Moonrise. <laughs> so 2004, when I was there, um, at this event, the moon was basically at its northern extreme right here, which is basically about 57 degrees off north. And if you notice right below it here, it says summer solstice sunrise, which is basically around 55 degrees. So they're really close. But the sun rises in this position every year during the summer solstice and down here at the winter solstice. <coughs> so if I'm looking at the eastern horizon, basically the, the sun rises about 55 degrees and sets about 120 every year on the shortest day of the year and the longest day of the year. And, and that doesn't vary. <laughs> but once again, the moon rise varies by rising a little further north than the sun and setting a little further south than the sun or rising far further south than the sun over this nine year period. <laughs> so it basically is all the way north. And then over the next nine years, if you watch the full moon rises, they'll track across the horizon to nine years later. Or nine years ago, it was rising at the southern extreme. And now it's all the way back at the northern moon rise. So this is another. Uh, solstice map that's maybe a little easier to look at, but if you place yourself in the center here, this is the eastern horizon, and you have the moon rise, the northern moon rise, and the southern moon rise, and the two solstice events. So anyways, this is what's going on in the sky every year at the solstices, and basically every, uh, every 18 years for the moon rises, they coincide. And the whole idea, if we go back here to the moonrise at Chimney Rock and the Pueblo was built there basically to be able to facilitate viewing the moonrise. And, and there's all sorts of theories about why they were doing it. The popular one is that there was Pueblo and priests that were worshiping the moon. And so, um, so. If we look at the great houses and, and a great house, basically, you all know what the great houses are. They're, they're uh, basically three or four story buildings. Um, they have up to 500 rooms like Pueblo Medito, Aztec did too. And the majority of them are situated in this pattern. So here's our solstitial map that we just looked at. And if you notice the great houses have this plaza area and then they have an opening um, down here, which is, so this is like three story, uh, they're tiered buildings. So the highest part, the third or fourth story would be at the back and then they tear down to the plaza. And then the plaza is uh, open. And um, this is, we're looking at Aztec and Salmon Ruins, which is uh, about six miles away from Aztec and then Chetro Keto, which is in Chaco itself. And they all have this U print with 
the, the, the courtyard basically facing the direction of the southern, <laughs> southern the summer, the, the southern uh, maximum of the moon or the winter solstice sunrise. And there's a couple of reasons why you would do this. And one is just the pure building heating, because if you have a building pointed this direction during the winter, you're going to get maximum heating in the courtyard. And plus, you have these events that are happening. <laughs> so in, if we go back here once again, in the courtyard of all these great houses, there's round ceremonial structures that are called great kivas. And the great kivas have been theorized as being ceremonial structures where people come in and, and do their thing and uh, probably on the solstices or the equinoxes. So these great kivas, um, there's roughly 150 great houses. Each great house has a great kiva. Not all of them are centrally located, but most of them are. But some great kivas are isolated and aren't necessarily associated with any building. And one of those is Casa Rinconada. How many have heard of Casa Rinconada? It, it's a great house in, it's a great kiva in Chaco Canyon that is set about a half a mile away from Pueblo Bonita. So it, it's isolated technically. It's like a 10 minute walk, but it's isolated. It, it is in the courtyard. <laughs> so if you notice, all of these great kivas basically have really similar designs. And what we're going to get into here is what the purpose of these designs might be. So if we go back to Aztec for a moment, and here's the footprint oriented to the direction of the moonrise that we're looking at. And once again, this is at the, the southern maximum of the moon. And this was the event that basically made me go a year later to the chimney rack event. So this happened in 2004 when I first started working there. And uh, basically we went outside and noticed that the moon was rising in the plaza. And at the same time, a friend of mine who was there visiting went inside the kiva and go, oh, come out in here, you gotta look at this. And basically this is the Southern entrance and the moon was caught exactly in this window. And it basically stayed there for about 20, 30 minutes. And what we're looking at, so this is the footprint of the Great Kiva itself. And this is the direction of the viewpoint that we're seeing right here. And the arrow is pointing out of the window where that full moon is being seen. So, Anyways, um, I was working at the park. I started like, wow, this is interesting and started getting out there and photographing it and then started looking up information online. Um, there's all sorts of neat astronomy websites that tell you where the moon and the sun and everything are gonna be at specific times. So over the course of the next year, uh, anyways, here's another shot. This is Gary Brown, who is the chief archeologist gazing at the moon through the window at its southern extreme. So I was still working there on the shortest day of the year, which is close to December 21st. And the, and the full moon that year was basically on the 26th and went back into the Kiva and it rose through this window. And basically this is the direction that we're looking at here. Um, so once again, the view is kind of perfectly captured in this window. And anyway, um, thought that was really cool. <laughs> here's here's the direction that we're looking at here for the for the the uh, winter solstice full moonrise, and then that summer the the sun rose through the same window and that's what we're looking at here in these pictures this is a series and there's the sunrise so basically the symmetry is the same for the the lunar extremes with the two solstices and the windows at aztec are set up once again to capture these views and this was the whole reason i ended up going to chimney rock because kim malville Basically, um, word got out and he heard that I was doing this and 
didn't believe it was the same thing going on, which set into motion this whole, anyways, that's another story. But um, I you know, kept photographing things and started paying attention to directionality all over the area while I was working there. And anyways, here is also the summer solstice sunrise. And if you look at the, uh, the small footprint here, there's uh, the Northern antechamber. And basically at the moment of sunrise, there was a light shining right in the wall of the antechamber, which is really cool. And there's this platform that's in the antechamber that has this white disc <laughs> and these three directional posts <coughs> on it that people have wondered forever what it is. And um, anyway, uh, so if you're familiar with Casa Rinconada, every summer solstice, people go out there and they see exactly what we're seeing here, a shaft of light shooting through a window and moving up the wall of the Kiva. Anyways, Aztec has a better one. <laughs> And this is coming through basically the same window. And it's shining here on, on the far wall. And sorry. <laughs> so let's skip to Chaco Canyon and Casa Rinconada. Um, what we're looking at here is, is Pueblo Benito. And Casa Rinconada is an isolated great kiva that's actually right here in the picture. And you can barely see it, but at the top here is a site called Sin Klitsin. And um, so here's, here's the Rinconada, and here's another site on the top. And this is Pueblo Benito. But what draws people there every summer solstice, once again, is this event. And like I said, it, it doesn't really compare to Aztecs, I think, because this is what they see. This is the, the, the beam of light coming through the window of Casa Brinconada and it moves up the wall just like it does in Aztec. So if we go back here, this is the footprint of Casa Rinconada, which you notice is really, hopefully you notice it's really similar to Aztec. It's got the same, the Northern antechamber. And the major difference is that Aztec has peripheral chambers that basically surround uh, the outside and Casa Rinconada doesn't have those, but it has these windows that are cut in similar places. So, so anyways, this is the symmetry laid over it. And that event that we were just looking at is the light shining in through the summer solstice sunrise. And once again, this is what people flock to see on June 21st. And literally there, you know, they get about 500 people out there to watch this. And, um, so anyways, where we were just looking at is Pueblo Benito and right across from Pueblo Benito is Casa Rinconada right here. And this is Chaco Wash. And if you notice the direction that it's going in, hopefully you're kind of catching on at this point, but it's, it's perfectly situated for the direction of if you're at Panasco Blanco to watch the winter solstice sunrise or the furthest south full moon event straight down the canyon. Unfortunately, when I realized this, it was middle of June <laughs> and uh, we decided to go out there anyways. And uh, to get to Panasco Blanco is pretty interesting. You hike down Chaco Wash, Here, here's the trail or the trail once again. And it's about a seven mile trail. And um, then at this point of the trail right here, you start climbing up the canyon wall. And that's what we're looking at here. And then when you get almost to the top of the canyon wall, there's this world famous petroglyph called the supernova petroglyph. And basically this one is thought to be a supernova that happened in 1200 or, or something like that, that people say, oh, that's what it is. And this is pretty obvious, a moon. And anyways, it's the moon and the sun, any way you look at it. <laughs> and then you keep climbing up and you get on top of the mesa to where Panasco Blanco is. And like I said, I was there during the middle of the summer, not, not on the shortest day of the year in December, but the whole reason that we went is because 
if you look at, so here's the solstitial map right here. And if you look at these two directions, this is the direction that Chaco Canyon is taking from Pinesca Blanca. And up here, the summer solstice sunrise or the furthest north moon event is in, aligned with Escobada Wash. So anyway, we uh, were up there. Um, this is Ruth Van Dyke who actually went on the hike. And this is the full moon and it's really hard to see, it's, it's right here, but basically it's rising out of Excavata Wash is the way it came up. So that was cool. <laughs> um, I never made it there for the, summer, the winter solstice sunrise because it's the shortest day of the year. It's freezing cold in Chaco, um, seven mile hike. One of these days I'm gonna do it though because of the, it, the only problem is you have to be there at sunrise and then the moon comes up at the end of the day. So have to hang out all day to catch both events. But this is kind of a recreation of what Penasco Blanco looked like originally. Here's the Mesa and here's Chaco Canyon looking down in that direction. And what we're actually looking at here, these are the, the, the sun, basically is here and the furthest extent of the moon is here. So from Penasco Blanco, anyways, one of these days, hopefully I'll make it out there. Unfortunately, I'd have to do it this year. I'll wait another 18 years, uh, but it would be a cool event. And um, while we're up at Penasco Blanca, notice that you can see all the way down across the Mesa because it's actually pretty flat. And about six miles away is that site that I pointed out that was opposite Pueblo Bonita and, and Casa Rinconada, which is Sinclitzen. And anyway, um, if has anybody hiked up there? It, it's a pretty amazing site. Uh, it's the same thing as Penasco Blanco. You have to cross Chaco Wash and then hike up the wall of the canyon and you get to the top. And basically the, the, there's the ruins of, of of this Pueblo. And um, here's a picture that I took. And what we're doing is actually looking straight north. This is Casa Rinconada. This is Pueblo Benito. And this is Pueblo Alto, which is on the opposite mesa from Sin Clitzen, and they're all in a line. And if it was a better picture, you could see the La Plata Mountains in the background here. <laughs> so if any of you know about Chaco, you've probably heard about the Great North Road, maybe. And, and what the Great North Road is, is this, this path that leads from Pueblo Alto North, basically towards Farmington and Aztec. And um, when you're up at the top of Pueblo Alto, you can see this peak. And right here is a map of the Great North Road, basically these dots running up here. And Twin Angels is up here, and you can see it from Pueblo Alto. It's like a little bump on the horizon, but you know, basically it just follows straight there, and you get by all these other, and, and it's really flat. You could walk it in a day, it's like 35 miles. But um, Twin Angels Peak. Uh, so basically, the, the Great North Road is the road to the north to the place where the people emerge that it's you know going back to the land of the, the dying and that's what happens when you get to Twin Angels and supposedly that's where the road stopped. And uh, this friend of mine that I worked with, Grant Smith, we thought that doesn't make any sense because we'd been to Twin Angels. And actually um, when you're at the top of Twin Angels, there's a little Pueblo right to the side of it. And from there, you can see all the way to the La Plata's right here. This is looking north. And from Twin Angels, there's this wash that's called Kurtz Can Coots Canyon and runs all the way down to the San Juan River and um, basically down to Farmington over here and the San Juan communities and Aztec and some and here. And so we went down angels, uh, twin angels, and, and continued the trail that was really visible and followed it all the way down into the wash and then walked the wash as far as we could. 
which was about six or seven miles. And um, there's a trail the whole way. And what's also interesting, here's Twin Angels in the background as we're going down the wash towards Aztec and the San Juan River. Um, you can't get lost. <laughs> uh, and anyways, there's these little sites all the way along the wash and, and, and Grant was calling them roadhouses. And it kind of makes sense. You know, they were evenly spaced about three or four miles apart. And there's a whole series of them. And the sites that are going from Pueblo Alto to Twin Angels are also the equivalent of like little roadhouses. So, um, so <laughs> if you continue down Coots Canyon, which is basically right here, and what, what we've done is gone from Chaco up to Penasco Blanco, back to Sinclitzen, and then kind of drawn this straight line over to Twin Angels. And then you just follow the wash down to the San Juan. And once you get to the San Juan, it's like an easy walk, basically down to where modern day Farmington is. And where Farmington is, is where uh, there's a place called Shannon Bluffs and the, um, basically the, the San Juan communities. There's, there's a group of five or six sites that are right on the edge of the river. You can see Twin Angels from them really well. And in addition, there's this, which is the La Plata River. So this is the Animus River, and this is the San Juan and the La Plata all come together at the site of the Shannon Bluffs, which is basically down here. Um, so this is modern day Farmington. And what we have here is the La Plata River going up and the Animus going this way with all these different great house sites or different great house complexes. So in the course of me doing this, um, I started thinking about isolated great kivas because I was actually living on top of a mesa right here by the Jackson Lake community. And I noticed an isolated great kiva there. So that set in motion a whole new thing, <laughs> which is kind of connected, but anyways, here, so once again, the Jackson Lake community, if we, if we go on the La Plata River North from Shannon Bluffs, basically the Jackson Lake community, which is about 10 miles up the river, is the first substantial community. And what it has, so this is the Aztec Great House, which has been excavated. This is the Jackson Lake Great House sitting in a farmer's field that's never been excavated. And you'll notice this, the same kind of U-shaped situation. And it has a great kiva right here, just like the Aztec one does in the plaza. And looking at it on a larger scale, here, here's the, the, the Jackson House great kiva unexcavated. And so there's a great thing about Google Earth. You can put yourself at any place on the planet and basically look at where the sunrise and sunsets are gonna happen or star positions from that position. And I started doing it with these different great house sites up the La Plata and the Jackson Lake great house basically has this small peak. So here we're in the plaza of the Jackson Lake great house where the great key is looking at the small peak on the horizon. And if I were to go there and <laughs> December 21st, the winter solstice, um, which I was intending to do, this would be the event. Here's the sun starting to set and here's where it actually sets right next to that peak. And basically from the plaza of the Great House, it's like this perfect line of sight to capture this event. So going up to that great Kiva on top of the hill, and once again, this, what we're looking at here is an unexcavated Great House and an unexcavated Great Kiva. Um, it's probably about 35 feet across, maybe 40 feet, and, and probably about 10 feet deep. You can't really tell it from here. But the problem is it's also been a party spot for a long time. So it's a great place to hang out. And that's the whole point. It's an awesome place to hang out. And um, anyway, looking from there, back south from where we just came from Farmington, here's the Shannon Bluff communities and the South San Juan communities clearly visible. 
this picture kind of sucks, but Angel Peak would be right here and it's a little bump on the horizon. But these points are clearly visible and there's actually another site over here uh, on top of this. But um, then when you look to the north from that great Kiva and, and now we're looking north up the La Plata and in the background here, we see the La Plata Mountains. Here's the La Plata River going up the valley. And anyways, here's, here's the different sites. And what we're looking at is Morris 39, the Holmes Group and Morris 41, which are kind of in a line going up this way. And Morris 41 is the largest collection. It had about 15 different great houses. It's a really large site on this terrace right above the La Plata River. And if you notice here, there's this rock formation. And it's kind of interesting because the Colorado, um, New Mexico border is right there. And, and this rock formation, the Navajos have always called it the snake. And if you look at it from there, it literally is a snake that goes for about five miles. And from, here's, a, here's we're getting closer now. And we're right next to Morris 41 on the terrace. And, and here's the snake with the cliff. And there's an isolated great kiva on top of that cliff that you can see all the way south to all the other sites in Little Plata that I just talked about. And um, here's another view from the north looking back at it. But the Great Kiva is on top of this hill, basically the Snake Formation and Morris 41 is down here. And Morris 41 has, like I said, several, I think the total count was either 12 or 15 great houses that are U-shaped with possible Great Kivas in the plaza. And this one is above them all. And to get up to the hill, isolated hilltop Great Kiva, you have to climb up this ridge. And um, it's La Plata Mine Company for a little bit, but you know, yeah. <laughs> uh, anyways, <laughs> uh, when you get up there, there's this feature that's this. It, it's basically about six feet deep. And as you can tell, it's about seven, eight feet around. And you can't see it very well in this picture, but it's got black staining all around it. And basically, if you did signal fires there, they would be visible all the way up and down. And if we look north, or this is looking back from the site, from the hilltop Great Kiva. And actually, when you get up to the Great Kiva, you can even see the southern communities more clear. Um, so the San Juan River is running down here, and there's the bluffs. And then if we look north from the Great Kiva, what we're seeing is this whole string of sites. Um, they were all excavated by Morris, and they're like P2, P3 sites. And basically, they run all the way up to Red Mesa. And then when you get to Red Mesa, you're up, you, you, you go to Mesa Verde. And then from there, you go to Hovenweep. And um, I can almost guarantee you there's kivas and sites that are connected line of sight all the way into Hovenweep. And a guy from Fort Lewis College did flashlight signaling from Hovenweep to different sites to show their interconnectivity. And then I, with another friend, found some other sites that were in between that we won't look at here. But anyways. Um, the isolated Great Kiva above Morris 41 had this notch. And basically from doing the, the Google Earth sunrise sunset, I knew that December 21st, sure enough, the sun's gonna set right in that notch if you're watching it from the Great Kiva on top of the rock. That one I got there for. And these are the photographs of that event. So basically, so what, what we're looking at here, this, this is the edge of the Kiva depression. It's actually, it's another big one. It's about 35 feet across, never been excavated, pottery all over and, and tons of ash, which is interesting. <laughs> and anyways, the sun set right in the rock formation. And here's another, you can actually see the depth of the Great Kiva a little bit, but this is December 21st, so it's freezing cold and snow on the ground. Nonetheless, um, so 
uh, you might be wondering what the whole point, <laughs> like what were they doing? And that, that's pretty much what archaeologists started trying to figure out all the time. And um, so here's the only the only words on the entire PowerPoint, but <laughs> basically what it's talking about is the fact that what what the the Hopi, the Tewa, the um, numerous Pueblo tribes basically have used kivas as places where the old men go in, do their thing, and and they make ceremonial sticks that are called pahos. And basically, what they are here's some that were found in Pueblo Benito. These and basically they don't have anything on them. This is a modern recreation. So they would have feathers tied on them. They would be painted. <clears throat> they might have other ornaments like these placed on them. And basically the, the old men would sit around the kivas, smoke, drink, do what, you know, make the pahos. And then at the moment of sunrise on the solstices or equinoxes, they would send the young people who were runners up to these shrine sites that are all over around the kivas. And, and basically, um, they would do a prayer with cornmeal, send the runners out, and they would deposit them on these shrine sites. And, and that would be the completion of that ceremony. So um, here's an example of a shrine site. Like what they look like are not buildings. Um, here's another picture of one that's um, <laughs> Basically, this is in Chaco Canyon, uh, Fajardo Butte in the background. But what, what the shrine sites are, are, are just piles of rocks. They're kind of indescript. Sometimes they could be higher, triangular shape. But they're basically line of sight connections <laughs> that mean things to the people. And what, what means things is sense of place, the land, and the direction, and the sacredness of all this. So anyway, um, that's my presentation. <laughs> and a final reminder, you can actually go to Chimney Rock and, and see this. That only happens once every 18 and a half years. So basically all these events that I was showing you are, you know, you, you can't see them all the time. And that's the point. It's like they only happen once during the cycle. Um, it's neat because we're at the cycle now and you can go see any of these yourself. So. I have a question. Yes. Um, I noticed that in, and I can't remember which cycle, I'm sorry. Um, in some cases, uh, I think it was Aztec, you were pointing out how that the light from the moon was coming through a T-shaped doorway? Uh, it actually never came through the T-shaped doorway. Or you saw it through the T-shaped doorway? Uh, no, it was to the window right next to the T-shaped doorway. Well, there was so, one that you showed where the moon was in a T-shaped doorway. Here, I'm almost. Where was that? So the, the windows that are going up from the from the kiva themselves are not t-shaped oh, but the entrance oh, okay. let me get to it here this view is a t-shaped doorway yeah, okay that's so the t-shaped doorways are entrances not the door okay so that's a window that's yeah and, and the, the the other one's a window not yet. and the windows are not symmetrical so it's like and and uh, for any of you that know about have heard about this before um there's a major argument that the great Kiva is a total Earl Morris reconstruction. You know, some people say he made it all up. <laughs> if he did, <clears throat> it's a pretty good coincidence. Uh, he wrote several times that he basically built everything according to the way he excavated and he thought all the features were actually there. So you can throw that out. Um, I found several pictures that <laughs> Sure, during the excavation, the, the whole problem is that the whole thing was melted down and kind of looked like the kivas I was showing you, the unexcavated ones, are just holes in the ground. But once you start uncovering them, you started finding all these features, and Morris took a few shots of those as they were digging them up. And uh, 
anyways, I, I believe he did the real thing. And the fact that it coincides with all these other great kivas out there, it's like, wow, bigger coincidence. Um, if any, anyways, this is highly contentious. Um, people have been arguing about this stuff for years, and they probably still will. And um, the whole problem is you can't, intentionality is something that's really hard to prove. And basically what I'm saying is that all these sites are arranged intentionally to, to do the things that I showed you. So the whole point is that they do do the things that I show you. So you, know, you can draw. Significance is interpretive. Interpretive. Do you, do you think that um, there's any astronomical phenomena that are tied in? I'm sorry to dwell on the teaching no. doorways, but. Uh, are there astronomical phenomena that are tied into the T-shaped doorways? Not, that, not or that. is it mostly the windows? It's, it's the windows. Okay. And uh, T-shaped doorways are usually at entrances going out to the plaza. Where they are in great houses, they're not all T-shaped doorways. They're usually windows, except the ones that go out to the great plaza are like the great cable when it comes out to the plaza. So there's nothing <laughs> astronomical about T-shaped doorways per se, if you know of. No, no. Okay. And T-shaped doorways are all over the Tarahumara. They use them too. And if you're bringing a bundle of wood in that you're carrying on your back, yeah, a T-shaped doorway makes a whole lot of sense. Yeah. Um, once again, people have been arguing about that forever too. You know, that's why I asked. Yeah, yeah. 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 Thank you, Jean. Good job. Do we have any questions? Uh, we don't have any questions in the chat. Yes, Amy. I was curious what the, the I, since it's out of my wheelhouse, how are they contemporaneous to one another? There's the real question. <laughs> Could you repeat? Uh, well, some, some, some of them are on are, are, are they all from the same time period? Or, oh, or similar. Or similar. Parts. And here's where. Um, where we start going into the mud, but um, my answer is yes. But the thing is, is that they're not just P2 and P3 communities, they're sort of basket maker. They, they basically have occupations that go from like, you know, 300 AD all the way up until the 1300s as everybody leaves. But um, if, does anybody know Rich Wilkinson? Anyways, he's done an incredible amount of work in the Middle East, Glen Warren, and um, I've kind of mentored off him, but I believe what he says that all of this stuff originated up around the Dolores area, um, around Dove Creek and Lowry Pueblo and Canyon of the Ancients, if you're familiar with that. And then it moved south down into Chaco, and the first Chaco and Great Houses are about 7,800. And, and so, anyways, then people, when Chaco falls apart, people moved back north. And these sites are reoccupied again. So a lot of the La Plata sites are from the 1100s and 1200s, but they're heavily looted. They're, um, so it's hard to say. But it could be a tradition. That's exactly it. This yeah. is, these are families. These are people that live there. Like, why do you, why is line of sight important? Well, that's where grandma lives, you know? And, and that's where this happened. And then you can see all that stuff and it's your world mapped out. And it's like, this stuff is important. You know, they didn't have big screen TVs, so this this was it. And, yeah. <laughs> you know. Do you have a question? Uh, yeah. Have you looked at the light phenomena just before and just after the solstice? Because the sun kind of stays in the same area for about a week. Mm -hmm. And the silver light should be pretty close, unlike the day before or day after. Yeah. So I'm not sure what the question is. So I mean that uh, you could go to all these places and avoid the big crowds by going the day before. Or the day yeah, day. yeah. So it's so pretty much. Yeah, so you have about a four day window, but there's there's two days where it's, and it's usually 21st and 22nd and uh, I'm both months. <laughs> I'm not sure. June and uh, December. <laughs> so yeah, the light's not quite, I mean, it's not quite as dead on in the middle of the window. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's what kind of amazes me. If, if Marl, Earl Morris never wrote anything about any of this stuff. He apparently had no idea people were paying attention to these things back then. And, and the fact that the, on the solstice is dead on in those windows, the moon is dead on. 
Oh. <laughs> you know. So if it varies a little bit, you can tell. You know. So they're pretty precise. Yes. <laughs> And have you, how do you think of that interpretation? So how do you, of, of the sun dagger? Mm -hmm. uh, you know the rock moved, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, it fell a while ago, so it's no longer doing the sun dagger. But, but that's a, that, that is the 18-year cycle that they were, they were doing the exact same thing. And so how do you, was one of the things that started making me think about it. That this is a bigger phenomenon than just changing rock. So it's like this consciousness. And her not all lady told me once that the moon is crazy and it moves all over the place, the sun's out and it's out on. And it, it's, it's ancient, you know, the moon's crazy, it moves all around. And, uh, so the how to view it actually tracks that because it has the nine circles going around the moon. At least it used to. <laughs> But there's a couple of other, you know about the uh, the one behind the bubble, you know, right? Oh, okay. But there's one there too. Yeah. And uh, the supernova petroglyph. Um, from what I was told, and I actually haven't checked it out, that lights up on the solstice. Mm -hmm. Or one of the solstices. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I want to make an astronomical comment, but not necessarily about the, uh, uh, about the, the probables that on Sunday, this upcoming Sunday, there's a, a total eclipse of the moon just after moonrise. And so I think a good place to watch it would be like from Red Rocks, because then you get a wide well, view of the eastern horizon. The rock is heavy to the and Red Rocks is kind of like our <laughs> Kiva of gender. But <laughs> 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 I don't know if it's all that bad at 10 p.m. It'll be totality. So. Uh, well, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.